put my pants on inside out or something. Uh, I apologize for the late arrival. I was varnishing my kitchen cabinets. And <laughs> I thought it would take five minutes less than it did. <coughs> the, uh, are there any questions about the last lecture? Yes. I have a question about the lecture before that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the electromagnetic mass put. Mm -hmm. um, the argument was we're going to be calculating matrix elements with the current occurring points. That's correct. And since the current is a member of an A representation, we take the cross product of two currents. Right. And then we take the symmetric part. Because it's the same current in both instances. Okay. And then we take a cross product of the final initial well the same state. Yes, but there it doesn't have to be the symmetric part, of course. Yeah. And then we look at transitions from the, the symmetric A cross A to the uh, We look at uh, um, <coughs> well, we've got four objects, two currents, an initial state, and a final state. We want to make an SU three invariant. How we put them together pairwise is uh, more or less irrelevant except it's convenient to put the two currents together pairwise because that way we can exploit the symmetry property of the electromagnetic, second order electromagnetic interaction. Okay, and then we, we can, uh, the real question is how many times does a singlet occur in eight cross eight cross eight cross eight? Symmetric, restricting oneself to combinations that are symmetric under two of the eights. Okay, and that was the computation I did. Is that, a, is that a satisfactory answer? Yes. My hands are full of polyurethane. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, other questions? Now, today we're going to begin <coughs> a whole new subject that will uh, occupy us for at least a week and a half or so after the uh, resumption of classes after the vacation. And, it's, 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 and um, will also occupy us in some extraordinarily dull arguments. But those I do not think will appear in uh, this lecture, uh, which is going to be an overview of the uh, subject of analyticity and dispersion relations. Hi. Sophomores. Now, <laughs> I think the best way to introduce this is to consider um, the circumstances in which the kind of equations we're going to study first arose uh, in the study of linear systems, either electrical circuits or perhaps uh, optical systems, systems characterized by uh, input, black box, into which you feed some input as a function of time, perhaps a uh, voltage, and you obtain out an output as a function of time. And that's not a Feynman diagram. That's a black box. It could be a pair of sunglasses, for example, with input and output being electromagnetic uh, field on one side and the other of the sunglasses. The, uh, because I write everything like a Feynman diagram. <laughs> Just as Nixon describes everything in terms of enemies, so I write everything as a Feynman diagram. <laughs> it's field theory paranoia. Now, the, the uh, output function is presumed to be a linear function of the input. And furthermore, I will presume the system is time translation invariant. So we have an equation of this kind where the system is, the properties of the black box are characterized by the function r, called the response function. I will assume the response function is real. And I will also assume that the system is causal. 
That is to say, if you have put in no input up until time zero, you will receive no output except subsequently to time zero. Of course, uh, this integral equation can be turned into a multiplicative equation simply by going to Fourier space. The uh, multiplicative equation is the Fourier transform of the output is the Fourier transform of the response function times the Fourier transform of the input. And I will define, since I'm never sure whether I'm using the same conventions as before for Fourier transforms, the Fourier transform is defined as integral dt dvi omega t r of t. Because r vanishes for negative t, in fact, with no loss of generality, I can make this integral run not from minus infinity to infinity, but from zero to infinity. The two properties, one and two, have definite consequences in Fourier space. The consequence of one is obvious. The response function as a function of omega is the complex conjugate of um, the response function at minus omega. And I should have put a twiddle on here. The consequence of two is um, everything tastes of some synthetic resin. <laughs> the smoking varnish. The, uh, the uh, paint thinner, maybe, though. The, uh, the uh, property of the causality property can be expressed as saying um, R twiddle certainly has the consequence whether it's a, a comp whether it can be whether causality can be reproduced from this I will leave as an open question R twiddle of omega is can be extended to an analytic function in the upper half plane, i.e., imaginary omega greater than zero. This follows from the fact that the integral runs only from zero to infinity. Therefore, if I give omega a positive imaginary part, I have a damped exponential throughout the entire range of integration, which obviously defines for the imaginary part of omega non-zero a differentiable function of omega as a complex variable, i.e., an analytic function. If I did not have the causality condition number two, I would not be able to perform such an analytic continuation because then there would be a regime of the range of integration where omega would be an increasing exponential and I wouldn't even know the integral converged. Any questions about this? It is convenient to switch to a new variable, z, defined as z equals omega squared. In terms of the variable z, let me draw the complex z plane. Well, first I'll draw the complex omega plane. In the complex omega plane, we know that um, r is analytic in the upper half plane. And we know, here's an axis, we know its value here is the complex conjugate of its value here. In the complex uh, z plane, of course, the entire upper half omega plane, all of the z plane, except for a cut along the positive real axis. And we know that the value at this point is the complex conjugate of the value at this point, those being the images of the two points on the left. That is to say, the second condition becomes R twiddle of Z, analytic, except 
for the positive z-axis. And uh, the first condition becomes our total of x plus i epsilon, where x is a real number and i epsilon, as usual, is something that goes to zero through positive values, equals r twiddle of x minus i epsilon star. The so-called Schwartz reflection principle. Schwartz, I guess. <coughs> this condition can, of course, be extended by analytic continuation throughout the entire complex plane. Um, <clears throat> it tells me that close to the real axis, r twiddle of z is r twiddle of z star star, although the analytic function of the conjugate variable is not an analytic function, nor is the complex conjugate of an analytic function an analytic function. The complex conjugate of the function of the complex conjugate variable is analytic. And uh, sorry, the sentence came out confused, but the right-hand side of this is an analytic function if our, if our twiddle of z is an analytic function. As is obvious, just think of the power series expansion complex conjugating the, both the argument and then complex conjugating the whole function, just complex conjugates the power series coefficients. And um, the, um, and therefore this is equivalent to one and is a statement that is true in the entire complex plane. Well, all of this is very nice. <clears throat> we have the response function for the system. And it has all these jolly properties as an analytic function. But what does it buy us? After all, we don't do an experiment that measures r twiddle at i. We always measure r twiddle for real values of these variables. Turns out you can get from these two statements an integral equation connecting the real and the imaginary part of r along the physically observable region, along the real axis, if they are supplemented with information about the high z behavior of R. In particular, <clears throat> if one adds to these things I will take as a sample condition the following statement. Limit z goes to infinity along any fixed ray. z equals zero, then one can deduce a integral equation, and I will shortly deduce a such an integral equation. If in that particular case of the response function, it is fairly easy to investigate whether or not that is the case. It, of course, depends upon whether our how smooth r of t is. If r of t is continuous or piecewise continuous, then standard Fourier transform theorems tell us that this condition is true. On the other hand, if r of t has delta functions in it or derivatives of a delta function, which might well be the case, then we'll get things that grow like polynomials and we will not have this condition. It's certainly a conceivable condition, yes? Do you want or r twiddle of z? r twiddle of z, thank you. However, for the moment, let us investigate the consequences of this condition, and then I'll tell you about how the thing is generalized if we have weaker conditions replacing it. <coughs> the trick <coughs> is to use Cauchy's theorem, Cauchy's integral formula, in the cut z plane, drawing a contour like this. Cauchy's theorem tells us r twiddle of z equals <coughs> 1 over 2 pi i integral along the closed contour, assuming I am at a point z in the interior of this contour, r of z prime over z prime minus z integrated dz prime. As I let the closed contour <coughs> Get, <clears throat> get bigger and bigger, I can neglect the boundary value on the big circle by this condition here. That goes to zero. And I'm left simply with 
the boundary value along the cut. Yes, sir. No, it suffices if you want to be really super rigorous. I will alter my lecture and say this is, goes to, um, if you will, z to the epsilon, where epsilon is some number greater than zero, say 0 0.01. Of course, I could weaken it a little bit. I suppose if it went to zero very, very slowly, I might get into trouble with oscillations. But if it also, if it goes like 1 over log z, that's quite sufficient. 1 over log log z might not be quite rapid enough. <laughs> Don't know. Didn't, didn't think about that. OK? But that's quite sufficient, and that's the typical sort of thing we'll get in most cases. We'll get powers for some epsilon greater than 0. There, that's safe enough. You can now throw away the big circle without even the purest word. Well, Mike says you're the only one who's going to um, finish off that word. That's not that. With only the integral across the top and the bottom of the cut, I'll write those two parts explicitly. They're both 1 over x minus z. From the top of the cut, I obtain r of x plus i epsilon. From the bottom of the cut, because I'm going the other way on the bottom, I obtain r twiddle of x minus i epsilon. Or <coughs> from the Schwartz reflection property, 1 over pi, integral from 0 to infinity dx, imaginary part of r of x plus i epsilon over x minus z. Okay, now I'm just wondering how he wants to clear this 46 for dumping. So this is a prototypical dispersion relation. In fact, it is a special kind of dispersion relation called an unsubtracted dispersion relation. And I'll tell you where that terminology comes from in around 10 minutes. Please note it is a relationship that, in principle, connects physically observable quantities. It enables us to deduce the value of the analytic function r anywhere in the complex plane from knowledge of its imaginary part along the real axis. In particular, it will enable us to tell the physically observable quantity, the real part of r, in terms of uh, along the real axis, in terms of the imaginary part of r along the real axis. So it actually connects not just uh, analytically continued functions, but real, honest to goodness, directly measurable functions. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I wrote dz, and that was a slip of the chalk. From this, one can deduce many properties of black boxes. For example, that it's impossible to build a perfect filter that is a band pass in a certain region and zero outside that region uh, in, in frequency space, et cetera, easily from this equation. Or if it vanishes in a certain block, outside of a certain block in this, along the real axis, its imaginary part vanishes outside that block, but then the real part doesn't vanish outside that block because it's given by an integral over the imaginary part, et cetera. However, I will not go into the constraints this puts upon manufacturers of sunglasses or hi-fi amplifiers. <laughs> go on. Of course, um, the, uh, to keep from avoiding our twiddles, writing our twiddles, I'll just write our prototypical dispersion relation for a function of a... Obeying the conditions 1, 2, and 3, just rewrite the equation, call the thing f, 
have encountered equations of this form um, uh, in, in earlier in this course. The Lehmann spectral representation for the propagator is also an equation of this form, although we, uh, when we, uh, we didn't derive it by things that had anything to do with causality. Nevertheless, it came out being an equation of the same shape. And in subsequent lectures, we will also derive many equations of the same shape by conditions that do not ha sometimes have something apparently to do with, to, with causality and sometimes do not. Uh, let's make a generalization. Let's consider various generalizations if the function has different analytic properties. What if something that doesn't happen in the optical and an analog? What if? Everything as before, including the high energy behavior. But f of z has an has a pole at z equals x naught. Some let me take it to be a negative number. Of course, if it were in the complex plane off of the real axis someplace by the Schwartz reflection principle, I'd have to have two poles, and that's a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> we can play the same game. In fact, I'll use the same drawing and just imagine there's a pole sitting here someplace. <clears throat> when we pick up the integral along the big circle, we pick up not just, uh, sorry, when we do the integral around the contour, we pick up not just the value of the function, but also the residue at the pole. Or equivalently, we could apply our analysis to f of z minus a, some appropriately chosen constant known as the residue at the pole, over z minus x naught. A is, of course, real by the Schwartz reflection principle. And therefore, when we do our integral, this thing has exactly the same imaginary part along the real axis as f of z does. And therefore, I get 1 over pi integral 0 to infinity dx over x minus z, imaginary part of f. Or equivalently, putting things onto the other side, f of z equals a over z minus x naught plus 1 over pi integral from 0 to infinity dx, x minus z, imaginary part of f of x plus i epsilon. <coughs> Thus, we obtain an integral equation of almost the same kind, except now to determine, for example, the real part of the function along the real axis. We need one little extra bit of information. We need to know not just the imaginary part along the real axis, but also the residue at the pole. Likewise, if there were 32 poles, we would need, we could obviously derive a similar equation, 32 simple poles with 32 parameters in it. And if we had some double poles, we'd of course need two parameters for double poles, three parameters for triple poles, et cetera. In the optical as well as the electronic analog, there are eight rigid poles in the in the complex planes. Not in the sheet we're talking about. Oh. Because then you would violate causality if you had a pole up in anywhere here. You do get a pole when you go through this cut lurking in the second sheet. Those poles are analogous to the unstable particle poles we discussed in perturbation theory last semester when we did the theory of unstable particles and we found the pole in the propagator was displaced into the second sheet. Okay, they're called resonances. That's which is why which is why unstable particles are also called resonances. <laughs> um, we will occasionally encounter functions which have um, cuts in slightly um, More, a slightly more elaborate structure, we will occasionally encounter functions with both a right and a left hand cut. They have a cut not just along the part of the positive axis, but along part of the negative axis. <coughs> 
suppose I call this point x plus, x minus. In that case, of course, we can use exactly the same trick to write what looks like almost the same kind of integral equation, except we have to take our contour like this. If left hand cut and right hand cut, then we draw exactly the same contour, assuming for simplicity no poles, and we obtain f of z with a integral over the right hand cut from this part of the thing. Or we draw over pi, integral from x plus to infinity, uh, 1 over x minus z, imaginary path of f of x plus i epsilon. From the left hand cut. Here, we're going in the positive direction below the cut. So we have 1 over pi integral from minus infinity to x minus, sorry, 1 over x minus z, imaginary part of f of x minus i epsilon. Ah, you're, if I did, oh, you're quite right. You're quite right, and therefore I wrote down the wrong equation, didn't I? This is going positive, and this is going positive. Thank you. I wrote down the wrong equation in my notes. I'm going above the cut in both cases. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it now becomes plus because of the error. You, because of the error in the error, which you pointed out to me. <laughs> the um, <clears throat> now, what if we have? Um, oh. Uh, we will find that this analyticity behavior here, although uh, there's no reason for you to believe it at this moment unless you trust me, is that we will find, for example, typically obeyed by forward scattering amplitudes as a function of energy. They will have be cut plane analytic functions, and we will be able to derive this kind of equation telling us how to find the forward scattering amplitude anywhere in the complex plane in terms of its imaginary part along the two cuts for example, for pi on nucleon scattering. Um, the imaginary part along one of the cuts will be something that we will be able to measure experimentally very trivially because of the optical theorem, which tells us that the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude is uh, a total cross-section, say for pi plus proton scattering. The imaginary part along the left-hand cut looks a little bit less accessible, but good old crossing symmetry will turn out to come to our rescue and that will turn out to be related to the amplitude for pi minus proton scattering, if we're original one is pi plus proton scattering, and will be expressible in terms of the total cross-section for pi minus proton scattering. We'll see all of that working out, but you can vaguely see, if I could only prove the desired analyticity properties, how you would thus get a very interesting equation telling us connecting the forward amplitude real and giving the real, both the real and imaginary part of the forward amplitude of pi plus proton scattering in terms of the total cross sections for pi plus proton and pi minus proton scattering. And we'll do it. We'll go through all the details eventually. I just wanted to give you a little preview. Now, <clears throat> In our systematic consideration of possibility, so far we've assumed the mildest form of uh, high energy behavior uh, for complex EV. What if we assume in place of our condition three? Well, let me assume just for simplicity, only right hand cut, no poles. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to work out the generalizations, which are trivial when there is a left hand cut and there is poles. But all we know about f of z is that limit 
z goes to infinity, some small epsilon, z added at the last moment for purist, v f of z goes to zero. Whoops, sorry. z to the minus one, f of z goes to zero. That is to say, suppose this thing is weaker. For example, if we had a delta function in our response function at t equals zero, then um, uh, the Fourier transform would go to would be one, which doesn't go to zero, but uh, it's one over z does go to zero. Now, in this case, of course, the trick is basically simple. All of our original assumptions are obeyed by f of z. over z minus x naught, where x naught is some arbitrarily chosen negative number. It has only a left-hand cut. It now goes to zero rapidly at infinity. And of course, it has a pole where the original function did not have a pole at the position x naught. Therefore, we can write down the form of the dispersion relation appropriate to a function with a pole, but with good behavior at high z. Thus, we obtain the pole term, f of x naught over z minus x naught, plus the by now boringly familiar integral over the cut, except the function in question is not now not f, it's f of uh, f over z minus x naught, so its imaginary part is the imaginary part of f over x minus x naught, x minus x naught being a real number along the positive real axis. Of course, we can turn this, this is just a special case of the equation before, the function with very good high energy behavior and a pole, uh, but we can write it as an equation for the function without the pole, simply by multiplying by z minus x naught. subtracted dispersion relation. I will explain the nomenclature in a moment, but is the derivation clear to everyone? Now, the nomenclature comes about in the following way. Certainly, conditions that obey our um, our uh, new high, old high z condition, a fortiori obey our uh, new high z condition, which is even weaker. So we should be able to reduce this equation from the original unsubtracted dispersion relation in that case. Let's see how it goes. If we have our old. Version relation with many symbols suppressed. This particular that implies at the point x naught, f of x naught equals 1 over pi integral dx over x naught, uh, x minus x naught, imaginary part of f. And then we subtract these two equations, one from the other. We thus obtain f of x minus f of x naught equals 1 over pi integral imaginary part of f dx 1 over x minus z minus 1 over x minus x naught, which by some elementary algebra, which you can do in your head, I hope, 
is revealed to be the same as our subtracted dispersion relation, whence the terminology subtracted. The point x naught is called the subtraction point. And the function and the number f of x naught is called the subtraction constant. As you see, when the high energy behavior, I shouldn't say high, well, in the actual instances, it will be high energy, high complex energy. When the high z behavior is not so good as it is before, we don't get quite as much information. It's rather like the situation where there is a pole. You don't know, in particular, the real part of the function along the positive real axis exclusively in terms of its imaginary part. You know its real part in terms of its imaginary part plus one other number, the subtraction constant, which is just another free parameter you've got to figure out from some point or just to fit experiment. So likewise, Of course, this can be generalized to the case where you have a function that is bounded by some kind of polynomial of arbitrarily high degree. Maybe the forward pi and nucleon scattering amplitudes require two subtractions, but maybe they're only one. By the time I get to the lecture on that, I'll look it up and remember which it is. <laughs> the, uh, do not confuse the word subtraction point and subtraction constant here with the vaguely similar terminology that occurs in renormalization theory. This has nothing, at least, there's nothing, no evident connection with renormalization theory here. And in fact, there is no real connection except in certain special cases. z to the minus n f of z goes to zero. That is to say, what if we have uh, n uh, behavior at infinity bounded by z, goes to zero like z to the n plus f one. <laughs> what if we have that in there with n replacing one? <laughs> the generalization is fairly obvious. Uh, in this case, we will have to divide by, so instead of dividing by a single pole, we will have to divide by some polynomial that has a multiple pole. And the final shape of our equation will look something like this. f of z will be not just a constant, but a polynomial. qn minus 1 of z, where this is a real polynomial real for real z, of course, real coefficients of uh, degree n minus 1, because here we ended up with a real polynomial of degree 0 for n equals 1. And then we'll have plus some other polynomial, pn of z over pi, real polynomial of degree n, integral from 0 to infinity, dx, x minus z, pn of x. And if we, if we are smart, we will choose this to have, yes, indeed I do, thank you, with no zeros for the real axis. I mean, it would be dumb to choose a polynomial that has a zero in the region of integration along the cut. Uh, I beg your pardon? Yeah. It's the same reasoning. You apply the argument to f of z over, uh, to f of z over pn of z. 
Pn of z simply replaces 1 over x minus z. And then from the residues at the various poles, you get a polynomial. This is called, of course, Qn minus 1 of z is a quantity that is completely determined in, in terms of the values of f of z at the zeros of Pn, where this term vanishes. Uh, this is called, of course, an n times subtracted a dispersion relation. If things are really disgusting and f of z is, for example, allowed to grow exponentially, there are no useful integral equations one can derive. Fortunately, nature has not presented us with cases of that kind. <laughs> The, um, this, you might think this is the end of the story, but we've been playing with high energy behavior, high z behavior, and you might ask what if the high z behavior was better than we <laughs> In particular, what if f of z goes to zero super rapidly at infinity? of z equals 0. Not just does it go to 0, but it goes to 0 more rapidly than 1 over z. After all, possibility. One can conceive of analytic functions that have, or functions analytic in the cut plane that have such properties. <coughs> well, in this case, we can derive a dispersion relation, an unsubtracted dispersion relation for z f of z, or more conveniently, for um, z minus x naught f of z. And therefore we write z minus x naught f of z, since that obeys all of our original conditions, equals 1 over pi integral from 0 to infinity x minus z, imagine f of x plus i epsilon, and, of course, now the imaginary part of the new function is the imaginary part of the old function times x minus x naught. That's just a dispersion relation applied to z minus x naught f of z. Now we get interesting, useful information if we evaluate this as z equals x naught. Since f of z is presumed to be analytic in the entire cut plane at z equals x naught, 0 equals 1 over pi integral from 0 to infinity imaginary part f of x plus i epsilon of course dx which I left out upstairs. Notice the same reciprocity between um, uh, about the point of our initial, initial high z condition. For our initial high z condition, you could, you could describe the imaginary part as you will and would then deduce the real part. If things were a little bit worse, worse by one integral power, then you needed one extra constant in order to deduce the real part in terms of the imaginary part, the subtraction constant. If things are a little bit better, one extra power in the other way, you have a constraint on the imaginary part. You cannot prescribe it freely. It obeys the following very interesting looking sum rule. We instantly see, therefore, that we will never have, if you believe what I told you earlier about the forward scattering amplitude, we will never have this sort of property, at least, for a scattering amplitude. That's too good to hope for, because the imaginary part is positive, being the total cross-section times positive kinematic factors. <laughs> There are some things which are beyond human ambition. <laughs> the, uh, this sort of relation is called a superconvergence relation. It was exploited uh, in the middle six, discovered and exploited in the middle 60s by uh, 
the uh, Torino group, uh, Sir uh, Fubini, Del Faro, uh, Rossetti, and I think Furlan and this go around. And um, it is actually, uh, they are useful relations, in particular in um, the scattering of high spin particles, uh, some of the extreme helicity flip amplitudes, those that change the helicity of by a lot, which are not forward scattering amplitudes, turn out to obey superconvergence relations, and this is, can be useful information. <clears throat> the, of course, we, just as for the subtracted thing, we can go on, and by identical reasoning, if we have the limit, Z goes to infinity, Z to the epsilon, uh, Z to the N, F of Z equals zero. By reasoning the same, exactly the same as before, we deduce that one, one over pi, although that's not really relevant since there's going to be zero on the left, X to the R, imaginary part, F of X, Sorry, that's it. Excuse me. Imaginary part f of x plus i epsilon dx equals 0 for r equals 0, 1, all the way up to n minus 1. In the previous case, we had n equals n equals 1, and r was only, well, we, we only had the r equals 0 term. If we have more of those things, we get all, this, all the other ones also. Reasoning is exactly the same as before. You multiply it by a general polynomial of order r minus 1, of order, sorry. You multiply it by a general polynomial. <laughs> you, apply, you can apply the reasoning as before to x to the r f of z for any, any, any of the stated values of r. z to the r f of z. Now, this is a general survey of how one can use um, uh, analyticity properties and um, information about high energy behavior, high Z behavior, to deduce possibly useful integral equations. At least we can see how they could be useful. I should say that the study of analyticity property will, is um, useful in um, other circumstances. Um, for example, gives us a guide in some instances of what are or are not sensible approximation procedures. The famous rule of thumb is that if a function is uh, smoothly varying, uh, that is to say if a function is, has no singularities in the region of interest, and the region is small compared to the natural mass scale of the problem or natural energy scales or whatever the variable is, then it's a sensible approximation to replace it by a constant because analytic functions tend to vary smoothly except where they are near singularities. That is a rule of thumb. Don't ask me to write it on the board, but obviously it is not a sensible thing to replace a function by a constant if you know that there is a pole very close to the region in which you are studying it. <laughs> and uh, this rule of thumb can frequently be used to deduce uh, sensible extrapolate, sensible approximations to make, and not what are sensible approximations and what are nonsensible, appro nonsensical approximations when uh, studying functions of this kind. And that plays a large role in uh, the sort of analysis involved in what is called current algebra, where you frequently have a deduced an exact relation or perhaps a sum rule for some physical quantity evaluated at some unphysical point where you cannot measure it directly and you're attempted to extrapolate it to the physical point just by saying, well, it's close by, it should be approximately equal to that. And then you gotta worry whether it's really sensible or not. And it helps you in your guesswork if you know where the singularities of the function happen to lie, because if there are singularities close by the region which, over which you are doing your extrapolation, it is not a sensible thing to say that the extrapolation shouldn't make a big effect. We will, t uh, I don't know, it depends, I don't know what I'm going to talk about after I talk about dispersion relations, what I'll do during the last month of the course. I may talk about current algebra and therefore discuss such methods. <laughs>
electricity properties found? Because you certainly don't find them from experiment. Well, the method used in the literature are as follows. General rigorous arguments. There are certain analyticity properties which you can prove without even assuming anything particular about the form of Lagrangian, just by assuming you have a local quantum field theory. We gave an example of that when we deduced the Lehmann Tulane spectral representation for the propagator, which was a dispersion relation statement about analyticity properties. And we deduced it completely rigorously just by putting in a complete set of intermediate states. If the theory was physically sensible, it obeyed the spectral representation, no screwing around. This method can, has been extended to more complicated objects like vertex functions and scattering amplitudes. But in general, it is very difficult. A rigorous argument is typically more difficult than a sloppy one. And uh, we not, I will not use it in these lectures, except, of course, for the spectral representation, where I've already used it. Two, one could show something was true order by order in perturbation theory. That doesn't give you quite so much confidence as showing it is true rigorously. But it gives you a certain amount of confidence if you can show to all orders in perturbation theory that the forward scattering amplitude obeys a dispersion relation. You might be fooling yourself, but the probability is probably low that you are fooling yourself. <laughs> this is the method adopted in the text of Bjorkin and Drell, and indeed my discussion will follow this method. Although I will organize the proofs in somewhat different order, I will actually follow their discussion more closely than I follow most of the discussions in Bjorkane and Drell. And it's the method I'll use to derive dispersion relations for vertex functions and for scattering amplitudes. I'll do that through the next week after the, uh, after the spring break. Third method that is frequently used in literature is guessing. <laughs> Or guessing using some simple model for a guide, some model less, com less complex than a quantum field theory, but simple enough so that one, but still complex enough that you hope it has some sort of structure, for example, from potential scattering. Potential scattering is much simpler than field theory. One can frequently prove analytic properties of scattering amplitudes in potential theory by merely by being very smart, not necessarily by being a genius. And then if one is bold, one can conjecture that similar analyticity properties prevail even in a fully relativistic system. Sometimes these guesses are wrong, and sometimes they are right. But it's a way of trying. You can at least make the guess and then work it out and see if you trip over your own feet or get interesting and plausible physical results. <laughs> the, uh, we, not, we shan't do any of that here, not because it's not a fruitful method, Although, of course, it has errors, which I have indicated. It has uh, pitfalls, which I indicated in my comments. But uh, it is a uh, possible method, and one that is used. Z limits found. One, rigor, again, it is possible, and there are some brilliant, brilliant pieces of analysis, in particular by Andre Martin, to use the analyticity properties and known quantities of forward scattering amplitudes, for example, unitarity, to deduce. Uh, high energy bounds. For example, a Martin has been able to show perfectly rigorously that for forward pi and nucleon scattering, no more than two subtractions are needed. Uh, and by, by part of this is one of the uh, most glorious passages in the in the, in the rigorous quantum field theory, the derivation of the famous Froissart bound. Those of you who uh, took 251 from me saw a hand-waving analysis based on the ideas of, of uh, potential scattering. I remind you it says that the total cross-section for any process does not grow more rapidly than the log squared of the energy. Um, 
Secondly, you can deduce bounds order by order in perturbation theory. You feel a little more nervous about that. You always feel nervous deducing high energy bounds order by order in perturbation theory, deducing limit statements rather than statements for things at a particular point. Even if you're a super optimist and thinks perturbation theory is convergent, uh, you uh, may say, well, it converges all right, but as I go to higher and higher energies, it converges more badly. So anything I get at any finite z is a true statement, but the limit as z goes to infinity, the limit of the sum might not be the sum of the limit because the convergence gets worse and worse. Um, the, um, especially this is true because these perturbation theory bounds typically say things go like a power times the power of a logarithm, and the power of the logarithm depends on how many loops there are in your Feynman integrals. So then you've got a power series in e squared log z, and when you sum that up, since you don't know the coefficients, God knows what will happen to that. That can come up to be a power in z. There are various sophisticated methods of getting around this, in particular one using a device called the renormalization group, but I doubt if we will have time to talk about this in this class. Then there is an entire law that will also not be discussed in this class, but deserves to be mentioned called Reggie Poles, named after Tullio Reggie, who wrote one paper on potential scattering and never thought about the subject again. But many other people thought a lot about the consequence of that paper. It's a method it, that has, is very well tested empirically, uh, uh, at least on this primitive level. Some of his, the refinements and exfoliations that have developed over the 15 years since Reggie's first paper are less well tested empirically and may well be wrong but it is a law about how you find out how scattering amplitudes behave at high energy. That seems to work very well when you actually look at scattering amplitudes at high energy. Perhaps with slight logarithmic, it says things go like powers, which are computable. Um, aside from slight possible logarithmic corrections, which aren't relevant from the viewpoint of deriving the dispersion relations, they do indeed seem empirically to go like the predictive powers. So this is a useful means, a useful way of doing things, and the only way I, um, it's not derived from anything. It's one of these guesswork things, but it's a very systematic, heavily checked against experiment form of guesswork. And the only reason it is not covered in this course is a shortage of time. It is an important subject. Do not think I think lightly of it. Fourthly, one can guess, again, on a less sophisticated level than Reggie Poles, using as your input, for example, experiment. How things seem to be going. This is the method I will use to the extent that I justify high energy, high Z estimates at all. I will uh, just uh, get, say, well, it seems that at high Z this is true, and take my word for it because I don't have time to give you the reasons. However, I should at least make a, sta a mathematical statement about how on earth you can guess high Z behavior from experiment, because after all, experiment will typically tell you things only on the real axis, and we need to get a dispersion relation, high Z behavior in the entire complex plane. Um, there is a mathematical theorem that tells us that under quite modest assumptions, the um, behavior of the functions uh, of the sort we have been discussing, functions that are analytic in the cut plane, or equivalently, if we hadn't gone from z to from uh, from omega to z, analytic in the upper half plane, can be their high z behavior in all directions is bounded by their high z behavior along the real axis, and this is a simple theorem to prove, and therefore I will prove it. I believe this is a very weak version of the frogman lindelof theorem, although I am not sure since I reconstructed the proof from memory last night without a text at hand, and it may actually be known as Cauchy's theorem or something like that. <laughs> anyway, I'll state this theorem.
I'll state a version of it, and then you can see, you can exercise, you yourself, after you see the proof, can put all sorts of, prove all sorts of stronger theorems or more general theorems. Theorem. Let f of z be 1 analytic in the upper half plane. I'll go back to upper half plane language. That's convenient for this rather than a cut plane. Two, such that that x plus i to the epsilon, absolute value of f of x, is less than m for some m greater than 0, epsilon greater than 0. I put in the x plus i, so I don't have to write down a condition where I would worry about singularities at x equals 0. Of course, it's really the statement that the thing goes to 0 more rapidly than 1 over, at least a, a, that the thing goes to 0 more rapidly than some tiny fractional power of x for sufficiently large x. But I phrase it as saying, it's, and also that it's uh, bounded and continuous, I phrase it in this way. It's not necessarily continuous. It could be piecewise continuous, but bounded on the real axis. Okay. For all real x, there is some upper bound m on this quantity. Of course, I add as a footnote that this implies that limit x goes to infinity absolute value f of x, absolute value of x to the delta equals 0 for any delta less than epsilon. <laughs> 3. I will assume that this thing does not go bananas in the upper half plane. To be precise, I will assume that it are the following condition. Absolute value of z goes to infinity for fixed angle. E the i alpha z, f of z goes to 0 is for any z in the upper half plane. And for any alpha, positive alpha. This is certainly true if the function is bounded by a polynomial for large z, because in the upper half plane, this is a damped exponential. The imaginary part of z is positive, and that certainly wins over a polynomial. It could even grow like e to the square root or e to the 2 thirds power of the magnitude of z, and this would still be true. So it allows for very rapid growth. However, I do not allow for growth of exponential rapidity for the third condition would not be true if I did not have exponential, if I had exponential growth. Yes? No, no, no. I just put the, I just put the pole in x. I put the zero in x down in the lower half plane someplace so I didn't have to worry about. Yeah, I'm sorry, that wasn't my idea. I looked somebody else and they raised the idea of the thing. No, 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 this is right. This is x. I could have been x plus 7i or x plus 32i. I just put it down someplace. I just wrote it that way so there wouldn't be a zero on the real axis. Okay. okay. Now, does everyone understand these conditions? One condition says it goes to zero for real x more rapidly than a power, some small power of x. The other says that for complex, for real z, I should say. The other says that for complex z, although it is allowed uh, to grow, it isn't allowed to grow with exponential rapidity as you go off into the upper half plane. Okay, those are our weak conditions. This is the one we get from Proving some, we'll get from proving something order by order in perturbation theory. This is the kind of condition we can hope to get from experiment because it's on the real axis. And this is the sort of condition where we cross our fingers. We'll allow it to be wild, but we won't allow it to grow exponentially. Under these conditions, theorem, 
limit z goes to infinity z to the delta f of z equals zero everywhere in the upper half plane and of course along the real axis for any delta less than epsilon. That is to say, the behavior on the real axis essentially it controls the behavior in all directions. And in particular, this is the case where we'd get an unsubtracted dispersion relation when you see the method of proof it will equally well apply to the cases in which we would get a subtracted dispersion relation if I had integer powers of z interspersed in the assumption at stage two. I would get the same integer powers of z coming out at the end. Now the theorem is trivial because I phrase the conditions in such a way that you can almost just write down the proof of the theorem provided you know one fact about analytic functions, the so-called maximum modulus principle. Does everyone know the maximum modulus principle which says that if you have an analytic function its modulus, that is to say its norm, is at a maximum on only at the boundaries of the region of analyticity. Its norm has no maxima in the interior of the region of analyticity. If, if people do not know, raise their hands because it takes one minute to prove. Oh, okay. Didn't prepare a proof, so it'll be a little sloppier than what I usually do. A little slop. It will be even sloppier than what I usually do. <laughs> Let me assume I have a function that's analytic in some region. And let me assume it has a maximum. Uh, f of z, assume. A local maximum in the complex plane at z equals z naught. Now, I write down the Cauchy formula. f of z naught equals integral dz over z minus z naught. Whoops, sorry, no absolute value yet. f of z. We all believe that. For my contour, I will choose circle z minus z naught equals rho, where rho is some small number I'll later adjust. A tiny circle around the point z naught. Therefore, this is introducing standard notation for the circle. Integral rho e to the i theta, that's z minus z naught, f of z, Write this way, z equals z naught plus rho e to the i theta. Whoops, I left out the 1 over 2 pi i. Bad show, I wouldn't prove the theorem without it. 1 over 2 pi i, integral from 0 to 2 pi. dz, which is rho i d theta. Okay, that's just explicitly doing the integrals. Uh, e to the i theta, thank you. Okay. This cancels this, this cancels this, this cancels this. I now will estimate the integral by saying the absolute value of the integral is less than the integral of the absolute value of the integrand. Therefore, f of z naught is less than or equal to 1 over 2 pi, integral from 0 to 2 pi, absolute value of f of z along the small circle of radius rho d theta. Is everyone happy? Well, you shouldn't be happy because if it were a local maximum, this would be impossible because the characteristic of a local maximum is that for a sufficiently small circle, everywhere on the circle, the modulus of the function is less than or equal to the modulus at the central point. But if it's less than or equal to its average value along the circle, which is all I've got here, cannot be the value at the central point. Reductio ad absurdum. <laughs> That's the maximum modulus principle. Is everyone happy? <laughs>
The maxima of the modulus, modulus of an analytic function always occurs on the boundary in a given region, analytic in the interior of the region, always occurs on the boundaries of the region of integration. Okay. Good. I will now apply the maximum modulus principle. Sorry for the digression. I won't get, well, no, actually, I'm almost at, what, at the end of what I plan to do. I won't get a chance to go on a bit. Um, I will now apply the maximum modulus principle. to the following region of analyticity, and the function I will study will be f of z, e to the i alpha z, uh, z, x, z plus i to the epsilon. That is a certainly a, whoops, sorry, do the thing wrong. It was upper half plane language I was using, wasn't it? You erase all that. Looks like this. Along the real axis, then a big circle. This is a region which, by assumption, f of z is analytic. What is the modulus of this thing? Call it g of z. Along this line, e to the i alpha z is just a number of modulus 1. So modulus g of z is, by assumption, less than m. What about the big circle? Well, along the big circle, for any alpha, this is supposed to go to 0. And if it goes to 0 for any alpha, multiplying by a power of z won't make any difference. So along the big circle, modulus g of z equals 0. Is everyone happy? That's assumption 2 and assumption 3. Yes, sir? Um, is g of z yes, certainly. Because the, oh. That's because I was an idiot. <laughs> Thus, I apply the maximum modulus principle. And I say, since over in this part of the boundary, the modulus is bounded by m, and in this part of the boundary, it's also bounded by m, since m is a positive number, throughout the entire interior, less than m in the entire upper half plane. Now, what is the modulus of, uh, this is, of course, the g of z equals modulus f of z modulus z plus i to the um, epsilon modulus e to the i alpha z. For any z, this is less than m. Whatever alpha is. And therefore, for any fixed z, m does not depend on alpha. And therefore, for any fixed z, I can go to the limit alpha goes to 0. And that is to say, I can make modulus e to the i alpha z as small as I want. <laughs> Therefore, the only way this can be true for any alpha is if f of z to z plus i to the epsilon is less than m. For all z in the upper half plane, from which the stated result follows trivially. Is everyone happy? Thus, it is not nonsensical to use experimental information. This was a 15-minute digression, but it's important because it's something that frequently confuses people. To use experimental information on the high energy behavior of a scattering amplitude along the real axis to make deductions about the high energy behavior of the scattering amplitude in all directions in the complex plane. Unless the amplitude really does something bananas, unless it grows exponentially rapidly in the complex plane, then the behavior along the real axis, along the boundary of the region of analyticity, determines the behavior throughout the interior of the region of analyticity. What is puzzling you? <laughs> 
We've concluded that this is less than m, and therefore if I take the limit, and therefore f of z, absolute value z to the delta, um, z plus 1i to the epsilon over z to the delta is less than m. And therefore, if I go to high z, since delta is less than epsilon, this is growing. The only way, therefore, that this thing can stay bounded is if this term goes to zero, which is the stated result. Okay. Explicitly. Now, uh, so much for generalities. I will now explain, give a uh, brief sketch. I guess I, if the time is wrong for me to run 10 minutes over often as I am tempted to. Uh, I'll drop a policy and end on time this lecture. <laughs> Unless there are any questions. Maybe people will ask a lot of questions and I can run over. <laughs> uh, I'm willing to take the bait. OK. going to prove analyticity properties order by order in perturbation theory. We're going to prove them for not a, I shouldn't even say order by order, I should say the general order in perturbation theory. We're going to prove them by looking hard at the denominators that come into Feynman integrals. Uh, if we have a general Feynman integral in a general field theory, and we presume we've arranged things together in such a way so that everything is ultraviolet convergent by putting in all the counter terms and everything, we have a sum of terms of a fairly simple form. If I call, say, QA the internal momentum, KA, running A runs over a different range, of course, the loop momentum, And PA, the external momentum, it may be a 42-point function. And then, I, of course, the Qs are linear functions of the Ps and the Ks. Given the external momenta and the independent loop momenta, you know what the internal momenta are. And if we have a theory, as I will assume, to avoid the problem of infrared divergences, where all the masses that occur in the theory are greater than zero, then a general Feynman integral will be of the form product of an integral d4k over all the loop momenta, product over all the internal momenta, of QA squared minus MA squared plus I epsilon. And maybe if this theory has spinners in it and to take care of those two pi's to the fourth I've left out, there'll be a big mess in the numerator. Some function of all the Q's and all the P's. Okay, that's it. There's no way of fighting it. It doesn't matter if it's been 13 halves. You extract the coefficient of gamma mu in the propagator or whatever you want to do. You've got, eventually, you end up with a function described by an integral of this kind. <coughs> now, as I stated last semester when I was doing loop lore, we can take this integral and analytically continue it into the so-called Euclidean region. That is to say, we can take PA and take its zero time component and replace it by E to the I alpha P0A. So we're going to do that. We're going to just make that replacement in this interval where alpha is a number that will range from zero to pi over two. <coughs> I will run a few minutes over time, thank God. But we're going to break the tradition of a lifetime. Okay. Mm.
At the same time, in order to preserve the linear relations, we'll do exactly the same thing to the time components, leaving the space components totally unchanged, of the uh, loop momentum. Oh, sorry, the Ka's. Well, we'll do it to the Ka's, and then it will follow that it will happen to the, inter to the various internal momentum. I wrote it in the wrong order. First you do this, and then you deduce that this happens. <clears throat> By this process, as soon as we get alpha non-zero, we lose the possibility of there being any zeros in the denominator. Because QA squared minus MA squared plus I epsilon then goes into Q0 squared cosine squared 2 alpha, cos cosine 2 alpha, I am sorry, minus space part of Q squared minus m square, ma squared, whatever the mass of the particle is. And we also have an imaginary part plus i, q0 squared sine 2 alpha plus epsilon. Now, as soon as alpha is non-zero, this is a positive number because 2 alpha is between 0 and pi. And therefore, we can drop the epsilon. And we can keep it going all the way until alpha equals pi over 2 when we arrive at the so-called Euclidean region, imaginary time components and real space components, Euclidean vectors discussed earlier in our integration theory, where cosine 2 alpha is minus 1, and then we don't have an imaginary part anymore, but the real part is positive definite. So there's again no zero, or negative definite, I should say. So again, there is no zero in the denominator. Now, if we have an integral with no zeros in the denominators, there's absolutely no problem in showing it as an analytic function, not just an analytic function of the single variable, but an analytic function of every variable you want, the 42nd component of p and the 37th of p1 and the 30, sorry, it's a four vector, I was going crazy. <laughs> the first component of p1 and the second component of p2, you know, whatever a combination of external momenta you want. You just differentiate the thing, you've got a well-defined integral, there it is, for any complex value of any component of any of the external momenta. So we have a region in which the integral, without doing any hard work at all, just by staring at it, is manifestly analytic. To with the Euclidean region and the strip we get to by simultaneously rotating with this alpha from the, uh, from the physical region to the Euclidean region. We don't know it's analytic in the physical region where we started out because there we need the i epsilon. We know it's the boundary value of an analytic function, but it may be a boundary on top of a cut or something like that. We also know something more. We know any Feynman amplitude is therefore an analytic function in the Euclidean region. And furthermore, we know path by which we can analytically continue back to the physical region, the path described by this alpha. That is a boundary value. And therefore, I will call this particular little line, one parameter line, or, or n parameter line, depending on how many external variables we have, obtained by simultaneously making this phase transformation on all the variables, the extended Euclidean region. And we know every point in that extended Euclidean region must be a point of analyticity of the function as a function of however many complex variables there are. This 32 four vectors is a function of 128 complex variables. For example, in the simple case of the propagator, I'll draw the complex p squared plane. And we'll start out, for example, with p equals p0, 0, as good a choice as any. This is the propagator, which is a function of only a single variable, p squared. Well, here we get quite a lot, because the extended Euclidean region Here's the physical region, p0, a real number. By multiplying this thing in the p-squared plane, we get the entire upper half p-squared plane. That's what we trace out as we let alpha go from 0 to pi over 2. So we've got analyticity in the entire upper half p-squared plane. Of course, we have much better analyticity 
for than that for the propagator by without fiddling around with perturbation theory, but still it's nice to see that we get something that agrees with something else, something we already know. We can, I'll go on for two minutes more and then stop, we can do even better because we also observe that in the Euclidean region all these denominators are real and have a definite sign. Therefore, this is not only an analytic function. If it weren't for the numerator factor and whatever powers of i's we had picked up, it would be a real analytic function in the Euclidean region. That is an analytic function that is real in the Euclidean region. Now, a real, sorry, real analytic sounds funny. It's a real function in the Euclidean region. Even if you have the numerator factors, they're just going to be polynomials and powers of i. So it will be a sum with some coefficients with involving possible powers of i. Of, real, of analytic functions that are real in the Euclidean region. Now, the Euclidean region corresponds to the left-hand axis. And if you have an analytic function that is real along a stretch like this, along this little real line, it's trivial to find an analytic continuation of it into the lower half plane because the analytic continuation into the lower half plane is simply f of z star star. By reality, that agrees along this line. If z is in the upper, it's an analytic function if f of z is an analytic function. If z is in the upper half plane, z star is in the lower half plane. They agree along a strip, the negative real axis, and if you have two analytic functions that agree along a strip, one is the analytic continuation of the other. Okay, so that's trivial. By direct inspection of the Feynman, this is called the Schwartz reflection trick. It's connected to the Schwartz reflection principle. By direct expression of the, by direct inspection of the Feynman integral, we get analyticity in the upper half plane. By Schwartz reflection, we get analyticity in the lower half plane. And therefore, we have analyticity except for a possible cut going from 0 to infinity. OK? Very trivial, right? All orders in perturbation theory. Now, of course, we know rigorously we got more than that. We actually, it's not only just analytic in the strip. It's analytic except there's a pole here at the meson mass, if this is the propagator of meson propagator and meson nucleon theory. And there's a cut beginning at the lightest two particle state. We should be able to go even further and pull that out of perturbation theory. And once, we've, once we've pulled all that out of perturbation theory by looking at the denominators of Feynman integrals and seeing where they can vanish, we will be prepared, having gained confidence and strength from reproducing our old results for the propagator, to go on to more complicated beasts and try the same tricks, like the vertex function or the scattering amplitude. Well. Think about what I've said because I said it fast, as I always talk fast at the end. And uh, we will take on this program again after the spring vacation.